<laughs> good evening, good afternoon, good morning, happy new year, and welcome black. This is the H <laughs> the HBCU Digest, Digest After Dark season opener. Um, Ow. Yes. <laughs> we have a very full cast this evening. We have Midnight Winston um, getting them into insert HBCU here. Laurel, the Aggie, um, not my frat brother, Eric, Katie from Poppin, and Dr. Una, the triple HBCU alum. Okay. So tonight. You know, you know, um, that the more jealous I get. You ain't gotta huh? get jealous. You just gotta get degrees. My degrees aren't at every HBCU. <laughs> oh well, oh, I mean you still out here living though, so like you got time. Yeah, I guess. Keep living, brother. I guess. And All you right. still are somebody. <laughs> You're right. All right. So first segment, just gonna hop right into it. Um, this is actually yeah our first podcast since the start of the new academic year. Um, typically, we would make predictions, but we didn't do that this time. So this is that episode. So in the last two months of this panty time, we have seen a few outcomes across HBCUs in the wake of students repopulating their campus community. Um, so first, I want your opinions on how that's gone for your HBCU and or and in the collective sense, um, I want to know, do you feel it was rushed? Was it premature? Um, do you think this is sim signaling or contributing to the signaling that the pandemic is over? Um, I would say, honestly, from the collective, it's been pretty good response, I think. Um, a lot of most of the schools uh, have, I think, have been in good position and seemingly been prepared to receive students. I would say particularly for us. Um, a lot of our partner organizations like Claflin, Norfolk State, Delaware State have done exceptionally well um, with receiving our young people and being ready for them, having things in place, being able to engage them responsibly, socially distanced, um, trying to be responsible about the events and things that they do on campus and on the yard um, to still allow them to have some sort of semblance of a normal experience. Um, so, you know, there's a couple, of course, outliers, um, Tiffany, your alma mater included that. Uh, maybe in some ways, some things are not as uh, as expected um, with receiving the young people and things being prepared. But in general, I would say the collective as a whole responding how we would expect and hope that they would respond dealing with our black and brown um, young people, particularly. So I, I'd have to say overall, I've been pleased with the response um, and optimistic about how they're trying to handle things moving forward. Um, you know, that's just kind of like a big swoop. Like I said, there's there's people that fit on different forms of the spectrum in regard to the 107. But for the most part, I've been been pleased and our, our students have been received well across the country to, to various HBCUs. So. so Winston, is there an HBCU in particular that you've seen do something that you don't have a partnership with? Oh, yeah, no. Bowie State. Dr. Dr. Johnson, I'm trying to holla at me, please. Like trying to get this solidified partnership with Midnight Golf because eagerly I am I'm impressed and optimistic about their leadership taking the stance that they took today or yesterday, whenever it was. Um, shout out to them because that's that's the kind of institution we'd be happy to send more young people to. Shout out Bowie State um for, for their response. Absolutely. And I think A and T has done a great job of one, just providing information and being transparent. Um, but I also think too, like what was said earlier, is that even with the best of intentions, there will be still be missteps. Um, and this is still an ever evolving situation. And um, I know you didn't get to it yet, but I think when thinking of like homecoming and things like that, I think schools moved a little too fast, not just that we're populating, but I guess the amount of students they expected to be on campus. And it's like, what I think, what should have, the process should have been is like, okay, let's focus on restructuring around getting students back on campus safely, managing vaccination status or access to campus, and then focusing on that. And then next year, think about, okay, 
homecoming and other events where it's not just students on campus, it's the, it's the public and people who didn't even go to school and things like that. And that was one thing I did not like a and doing. I don't wanna see stuff in my email from a, you know, speaking to alumni after you're asking me for money, then you're asking me, oh, do I wanna join the conference call as we discuss homecoming? And I'm like, homecoming? And then not to toot my own horn, but I'm gonna do it anyway. As the greatest homecoming on earth. And now that population for Jiho, of the population for Jiho, other people outnumber actual alumni and current students. It's and it's in North Carolina. I don't really know what the state is doing. So it's just like in Greensboro, I mean, that many people in Greensboro, I it's just a snowballing situation. And they add they surveyed people and they said, Well, how do you feel? And in the little Google form, I said, I was just like, no, like this isn't safe. Um, we still everyone hasn't even gotten the booster shots. Everyone hasn't even been vaccinated. Let's start there. And I know the old heads want to be there. That's not safe. They already sent another email where they canceled basically being on the yard. The Greeks can't gather. There's no Aggie Fest. There's no parade. I'm like, so then why are we here? That's not home. That's not homecoming. I don't know what was. I don't know what Howard's doing. I don't even want to know. But it's like, it's okay to wait another year. Next year is my 10 year anniversary. I would love to be there physically for that with a booster. Um, but it's like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna risk my health, even though I'm only 31. It's like, I don't, I think they should set an example. And like, again, once again, students should be your number one focus. You can focus on the money and other people and celebrities and Diddy and whoever later. Focus on your main stakeholders first, students and faculty and staff. Then you can get you know, because we don't know how this is going to mutate. There's still people protesting about not wearing masks or getting vaccinated. Now that it's moving toward, and this will happen, individual states and metropolises saying, oh, if you're an employee of the state, you have to be vaccinated. Or now with Biden, and it's and there's federal precedent, so you can't really argue it. So it's like, what, you know, let's not, we have a wish list of things we want to do, but I think we also need to be a little bit more realistic. And it, and, and in some cases, it seems like people didn't learn anything from the past year and a half, which is sad. They didn't, and you are right. Um, Una and then KD. So um, I think Hampton did a good job. They, like Laurel said, um, well-meaning. Um, however, the contingency plans that they have, that the students came up with, um, from what I'm understanding, it, it's not realistic. If a student gets COVID, where are they supposed to go if they're out of state? Like I think about myself coming from Brooklyn, going to Hampton University, and if I were to contract COVID, where would I go? I gotta take a Uber somewhere. I gotta be around other people because I'm not coming home. So how does that work? Now I'm contaminating other people, putting other people at risk. Um, we could have waited. It's about to be my 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 20 year. So um, with that said, don't don't do me, y'all. So with that said, like we're planning for our 20 year, but that's you know what I'm saying that's coming up. That's not right now. So we could have waited, especially because it's you know it's us. But it's definitely you got people that with their their frontal lobe isn't is informed yet it hasn't closed yet and you're expecting them we, we had the same conversation last year like we're expecting them to make decisions that adults would make and they're not capable so i think all in all well-meaning but too soon to your point because some institutions <clears throat> have been housing students at hotels. And I just keep thinking like, do we have the monies for this? Are the monies gonna run out for this? If if students think they can get a staycation, would that make you think that's, that's not going to, and we weren't going in and out, that was me. Being in quarantine or in isolation, at this point, it's not enough to scare people into being responsible. And I don't know how much money we got collectively um, to just spend 
on hotel costs. Like we don't, we don't, we don't have it. I don't think, I, no, not I don't think we we don't have it. Won't won't have it, Katie. Yeah, funny man. Um, and it's kind of fascinating that we're having this talk on the college level, right? Because I I am a K twelve educator, and we've been thrown in the classroom with much with. Well, I won't say much larger populations, but in much tighter spaces than college students. Um, and I really don't have nothing from my campus because Coppin is small. It's not, we don't do homecoming in the fall, so there are no gatherings to look forward to. So we're focusing strictly on academics, I'm sure. And I'm going to just say that no news is good news. Um, so if they can stay in the classroom and nobody gets sick, I'm good with that. You know, um, and, I, you know, the other thing that's just poking out in my mind as we talk about conversations we had last year, it was about this time last year where Jared said university presidents were echoing. At some point, we got to learn to live with COVID. And I think we just seen the fallout from that. I really, I really people, I really think people have just decided that if you die, you die. Um, and, you know, there is there is no price <laughs> that they're willing to pay to not go to school. So we're here. And then we just gonna have to keep rocking, whether we like it or not. Um, unless you just don't want to participate in the economy at all. And then that's on you. I feel it. I do, I do, I do feel it. But like, do we have life insurance for that? That's a I whole other said, podcast. I just said if you die, you die. Okay. But like, do you have the, <laughs> do you have the life insurance to just up and die? If if I'm being honest and thinking about the profile of the typical or the average HBCU student, if you are Pell Grant eligible at a at a varying level of low income, do you have, do, do your parents have, did your grandparents take out life insurance for you to just up and die? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not betting on that, but all right. I take your point. Um, chaotic question. Um, and Una, Una and or Laurel touched on this. Do you believe that if we didn't repopulate so soon, that homecomings could actually be a thing? Would you have wanted your HBCU to say, yeah, no, we, we're not doing on-campus learning. We're not doing a residential campus. But this homecoming, this homecoming we will have. Would you Would you have liked to see that? For one weekend, the weekend, y'all were able to come home. Would you have preferred that than, than what we're living through now? No. Okay. I concur. Like, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's like the, the meme says, it's just not realistic. It's just not realistic. And then like specifically with a and it's, and I don't want to sound prejudiced or anything like that, but it's like, I'm not really going south of Maryland. Oh, you right about it. Before okay. before it was like, okay, I am not going anywhere near the state of Florida. But that has since expanded. And it's like, and also at least for North Carolina, politically it's changed a lot since I've been there. Mm -hmm. And so it's just like, I don't really know what I would be walking into. And then like, let's say they do have it and it's just, okay, alumni only and people that actually have a diploma that says North Carolina a and State University on it. What hotel am I gonna stay at? Who is running that hotel? Where are their COVID protocols? Are they enforcing mask wearing? Who else is staying at that hotel? And they've already said Delta variant is highly, highly contagious. See, I have not been sick. And uh, it'll be three years in two months. I've not been sick in three years, including COVID, not even the damn flu, not even the common cold. I am not risking that to be amongst a horde of Negroes in the state of North Carolina, in, not even in Aggie land, not even. I do not want green eggs and ham and no, I do not want <laughs> the Delta variant. I don't want it or whatever, whatever Greek letter we're on now. Cause I don't, I don't know. I'm sure there's Lambda. Look. There's a, there's, so when, a, there's a mirror somewhere. So when the Omega variant comes out, <laughs> I surely will not be there. Will not. Okay. Absolutely. Eric, what, what, do you, what were you saying? 
I say it is we don't even know if it's gonna go for two letter chapters. Like at, at this point, it's never no. I'm gonna keep going on. <laughs> it's like no, so the one thing I will say is I think because we had all these festivals and concerts um over the summer and spring that that's that was the barometer of whether we could have homecoming or not. The problem is that you can't risk your um customers dying because your customers have to keep returning <laughs> in order for you to uh, <laughs> in order for you to sustain. So that's why they're limiting homecoming events. But <laughs> I, we knew these things were coming. Like I, I, I hope we're not playing the shot game. Like we knew what it was. I will say, a few weeks ago, um, these students here had a '90s themed freak Nick party, and I was looking on the timeline. I saw that, and I said, "That's your homecoming. You're welcome." Okay, like I was just like. What are we doing? What are we doing? Like, there are people who are complaining that students aren't wearing masks during academic hours in the academic buildings. But I'm like, if they live on campus and they're doing all this other stuff, do it really matter? Nope. It doesn't. You, but it does. No, no, no. It does not. Because if you want it to- So it's not about... So don't think about the student-to-student -student contact. Think about the student-to-staff contact. Where they're doing things right. Right, the staff is doing what they're supposed to do. You know, let the students kill themselves. Just don't don't kill the the, the tenure professor that's been here for fifty years. But like <laughs> that we why? can't just easily replace. <laughs> oh, oh, but that's not why, and that's not because. So two things here. I agree when you said returning customers. When thinking of students, even if they don't die, and I don't want to say it like that, but mm, um, even if they don't die, there's still no guarantee that they will return next year because even now, especially those schools with housing issues and uh, mushrooms and told people growing in the hallways, um, I'm not returning to that campus. What is your I'm, not, I'm not returning to live. Plus, faculty and staff, whether they are old, immunocompromised, whatever, right now in higher ed or even education period is the great resignation. People not taking it no more. So as you teach in K-12, you should already know this, that students are back in the classroom now. When they, the last time they were in the classroom, that may have been a, a grade or two ago. So some of them may be behind, to, behind. Then, I don't know if this is the case for you, but you also may be a teacher where now they done threw two new curriculums on you. So not only do you got to catch students up, okay, I know they can do that, but in other, I've talked to teachers from other states and they've been saying like, they want us to deliver two new curriculums. I'm still trying to catch these kids up and we got to deal with parents and we got to do this. And then at the higher ed level, it's the same thing where, or if you're at a campus in a state that does not have a mask or vaccine mandate and you out here and you got students, you got 45 student class, only five of them is wearing masks. The other 40 don't care. So on it's like those, I, yeah. on top of everything else. So it's mm -hmm. like them staff, them faculty, them students, if they survive until next school year, they're not going to come back. And the students that don't come back, come back, that's money. That's enrollment. That's enrollment management. And I don't think anyone is really thinking hard about like, OK, yeah, they're complaining now. But what about next year? What about the dollars? Mackenzie Bezos only got so many dollars. And she might move on to another industry and say, oh, no, I'm going to focus on food companies or food employees now. So employees at Nabisco and stuff, they can get some dollars. Higher ed, you good. Ask the government. Y'all got a new Department of Ed person. Holla at Biden. I mean, I, oh. oh, go ahead. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm, you're good. I would I would add too, like all the people that's trying to shice the system. Right. So like it's mad. Like, OK, so in New York. We got a card. I was looking, trying to look for it while y'all was talking, but we got a card. Wasn't no other documentation. So it was, it was Oak Tag. Who can't remake that? So when you're showing that, when you're showing that to, you know, to whomever that, you know, oh, okay, I got vaccinated. That joint, like that, the, 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 docu the card that we got was so 1990. Like it was ridiculous. Right. So I know me, if I wasn't, if I, I am vaccinated, however, if I wasn't and I was trying to shice the system, oh, that's simple. That's easy. 
on top of you have uh, speaking to what Laura was saying, if you're going into the in, here in New York City, if you're going to the K-12 classroom, students are mandated to get vaccinated. So you're walking in. I mean, granted, they um, the mandate is going to go into effect on Friday by 5 p.m. You have to be vaccinated um, if you're NYC DOE. Um, but students don't got to be. And if you're working with, especially working with the population under 12 years of age, hold on. So there, there's a lot of stuff I don't think that the, the, the higher ups thought about prior to implementing. I will say to your point, Una, because, and I, if, okay. So at home in Detroit, they have vaccination sites, right? There is a whole system that they use to verify your vaccines. And it's not just this vaccine, it's all the vaccines. So in my head, I'm like, well, do our state institutions have access to that? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. Yes and no. Are they using it? Yes and no. Again, you got to think about, and this goes, this couples with education. Each state got a whole different system. It is not nationally like what yeah. it needs to be. No, that's true. It's not nationally consistent. So what Maryland doing is not what New York is doing, is not what Crack Tucky is doing, is not what Texas ain't doing. So it's like, oh man. It's, and that's why, again, it with, so like, what Una was saying about, oh, people can fake that, they faking that. There's people that work at CVS and they say, give me the codes and I can give you the codes to put it in. Someone's printing out VAT cards, selling them $500, even though the vaccine free. So, so free. it's. <laughs> I got so free. The most, the I'm going to give the last word to Eric. The most depressing thing of all this is that it really isn't that hard if people buy in. I work on a campus that has 40,000 students. It's real simple. It's put everywhere. Like every single day I go into the office, I got to go in and check in. They ask me questions like over the last 14 days, where have you been? What you've been around? What's the last time you was on campus? Do you feel any of these symptoms? Like literally every single day, I got to do this on my phone, right? Standard mandate. If you're outside, you don't have to have your mask on because it's open airspace. If you're inside, you have to keep a mask on. And it's so weird because I talk to other people that work in the same field. And on much, much, much smaller campuses, you can't get people to be like, oh, well, you know what? I want to continue with school. I, I, I don't even want to be back in the crib right now. I hate. So we got all in person classes. There are, I mean, there are on they have they have some online courses, of course, but our rate right now of people who are people who are not vaccinated on campus and they have to be by a certain time point, there it's like at a one point three eight percentage rate of like infection. Like it's it's utterly ridiculous, just seeing what happens when people buy in. My question is, and this is probably a, a bigger issue with blackness, at some point. When are folks going to leave the conspiracy theories alone? Because I would get you most of the time, but unfortunately, this is impacting white people. They ain't about to lie about this. Like it could be a lot of stuff they lie about. It's a lot of conspiracy theories. But if it was if it was killing only us, then yes, I would question the vaccine. I I get that, but it's killing them too. It's actually like it's so at some point. Stop going down the YouTube hole. Stop listening to your favorite rapper who be lying to you on all their records anyway. Stop like it's it shouldn't be this hard. It really shouldn't be. Stop listening to your favorite NBA player. Like stop listening to governors and and and, and senators who say it right to your own body, but then they outlaw abortion. Like stop listening to all of them. Like it shouldn't even be this hard at this point. Yes. Um, next topic or next segment. Um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna give Laurel Laurel the the first the first go at this because as it was happening in real life, we were texting back and forth. So of course you all know that 
about four weeks ago at this point, at the start of September, there was the 2021 White House HBCU week. It came and it went grand opening, grand closing. Um, actually, the Fam Ewan, <laughs> the Fam Ewan, so the the Fam U student newspaper, they literally had a story or had an article and it said, Did y'all know it was HBCU week? I said, Yep. All righty then. Um, so for those who tuned in, um, and as I said, Laura will go first. Um, please share your experiences and your opinion um, on how engaging the conference was. How do you think they could improve? I will also say that um, there were things that I was looking for to be settled um, that are still actually not settled. So for instance, there is no executive director right now. Um, but in terms of comparing the Biden administration to the Trump administration, the Trump administration did not name one until October. Um, so like, you know, we are two days from October, I, I, I guess, but like to be early is to be on time, to be on time is to be late and to be late is unacceptable and to have an HBCU alum who is also Greek, um, in a position of authority who is, you know, that's that's who we wanted, who we came out for. Like, we expect more, right? So, Laurel, you got it. <laughs> <sighs> Let's see, where do I start? I mean, just saying that it was very ghetto is just not an all encompassing word because I was registered and dealing with technology, I always approach technology as if I was an old person in terms of accessibility. One, it was not accessible for anyone that was different, differently abled, older than 50, because I was registered, I registered a month ahead. Why am I looking at XYZ session? And there was no link. There are no instructions. You're telling me, oh, we're going to talk about this and these are the presenters, here's their bio. But I can't see anything. So I don't know what you're talking about. Two is the content of the sessions. I've been going to this conference on and off for the past five, six years. <laughs> Each time, it's always STEM, entrepreneurship, financial aid, and then we're going to sprinkle something random like international ed or something else on the end even though you have the entire government at your disposal. Disposal, not disposal. So it's like you have an entire government that does so many things that even the people in government don't know what everybody do. And yet each time you have the conference, we're just gonna focus on STEM, entrepreneurship, financial aid, and maybe throw in that we have some jobs opening at Social Security Administration. You're not gonna talk about the Presidential Management Fellows, which just opened yesterday. You're not gonna talk about the fellowships like Wrangell and Pickering that are funded by the State Department. You're not gonna talk about the many, many, many pathways, internships and jobs and co-ops that will pay for your tuition and give you a salary at the same time. Oh no, we're not gonna talk about that. We're gonna keep talking about everything in the clouds, all these partnerships, and exclude the actual meat for people at the admin level. And so just from experiencing that, I was like, okay, whoever is still on staff for this that hasn't already quit, um, they're definitely old. They are definitely out of touch. They are definitely not HBCU connected. And if they are, they have their own career and agenda in mind. It has nothing to do with students, which I feel like their only real student engagement is the all-stars or whatever they call themselves now. I'm like, if they're supposed to be ambassadors, then what are what are the students doing? Because they should be your tentacles on whatever campus they at. And da, da, da. Cause we had some, didn't know who they were. So I think they're not, they are not embassing, okay? They're, they're not embassing, they are assing. Um, and it's, I didn't, I didn't know it was HBCU week until like Wednesday. I didn't know C CBC even happened until 
I saw that they had the concert on that Saturday with D Nice and, and Nas, and I was like, oh, that's cool. But what did what did CBC niggas do? I, okay, so it's just like I think it's partly there's just so much going on right now with COVID and everything, and people being upset at Biden. Oh yeah, the government about to shut down in two days. Um, all of that, but also I feel like within government at large. They've been for the past 10 years, they've been saying, hey, we really want to get a younger workforce. Our current workforce is aging out. They're retiring. And then Trump happened. <laughs> um, and so what other people that were still there? They left because they were like, nah, we not we not doing part of it. You doing like illegal shit. I'm out. And so they also have a skeleton staff. They're not admitting that, but they do. And so. Moving forward, I think they need an overhaul. They need to really go back to the drawing board and like, what is our purpose? What is it that we want? Do we want more HBC graduates in government? Okay, how do we do that? Well, we have these programs and these partnerships and these pipelines. Let's make sure everyone knows about them. And then actually with the younger workforce, maybe you will get the engagement that you seek because you're not still doing old people things. Old people are still on conference calls. We on Zoom, baby. We on social media, okay? FaceTime, that's what we doing. So it's like, if you're not doing that, because the government is always 20 years behind private sector. So they are still in 2002 right now. <laughs> and I just think, I don't know, I think with Biden's administration, I don't know where he's going after, after the stuff with Haiti and Afghanistan, it's looking real, real spooky. So I don't know if they're going to get, I don't know if they're going to get black people. I'll just say that. I don't know if they're going to get people who are being directly affected by stuff. And I think all of those things are directly connected. And let's say they do do better next year with the conference and actually market it. I don't know if anyone's actually going to show up or care because it's like, well, what, are, you know, if I can't see what you're doing, why do I even want to be involved? So they get asked for me. I want to, I want to give Winston some time, um, because he, you got it, Winston. Yeah. Um, I'm, uh, I am confusion. Uh, I, so cause Delaware state just spoke, it's HBCU week at Delaware state, but then fam, you was talking about HBCU week before. So, and then Clark was saying it was HBCU week. Here's, so here's the difference. Okay. So that was so what was in sept earlier in September? Uh -huh. That was the federal week, right? Okay. That's that's been the thing that's been happening. What's okay. happening over in Wilmington is actually Christopher's and the city of Wilmington, Mayor Mike P's okay. HBCU Week Foundation organization. Um, you all might remember from a few years ago. Um, we had Ashley Christopher and Earl, and Ashley Christopher is a Howard woman, also went to UDC uh, Law School. Was it? What is it? Don't say it. David Clark. Yes, David A. Clark. Yeah, David A. Clark Law School, um, and Earl was or, or is I think a Morehouse mm -hmm. alum, and they both worked for um, the Wilmington Mayor Mayor Mike P. Um, and literally, he said. This is what I want to do. I know y'all can make it happen. And it's literally grown from 2017 to now. It's only four years. And they really have turned that out. They're making the difference. Um, and it really is like the perfect balance between a public and private endeavor. They have corporations that are based in Delaware contributing to this. In addition to city government saying this is what i want or what we want for our students i know you know we need that in detroit winston oh no for sure no, so that's I... what it is so like yes it is hbc week so Again, everybody's gonna have their own hbc week basically like you just pick a week in the fall well, remember, and everybody has... remember at home we had an hbc week in 2017 because ian kyers did it, oh. and then we had it in 2018. Georgetown guy spent a lot of time on on the yard at Howard, though. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then it fell off when he wasn't reelected. Um, doing my best to bring it back though. Okay. Not for yeah. 2022, but yeah, that's how it goes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, it's kind of hard to keep up. So that 
even makes it a thing. I mean, Laurel, you know, fired off enough shots about in general. And I would agree because I also I also registered for that when it was still they were still debating if it was going to be in person or not. And so then they sent an email like we're not going to do it in person. And then you had to go through, you know, there were, actually there was no process. That was another thing that was slightly confusing. Like, so then it was when it wasn't in person, there was no like, oh, okay, so maybe you want to re-register for what events, how we're going to do said events for the week, those kind of things. It was a little bit confusing uh, or hard to keep up, like I said. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of room for improvement on it. I think there's a lot of room for it to be a lot better and intentional. And, you know, as like I said, was already stated, like you have to think about those people who are engaged and involved that are not millennials or zillennials or whatever else, you know, that that uses, you know, the technology and is in, you know, vastly more, more more able to understand and navigate those things. If you're not thinking about those people, then it's almost pointless to be doing these things electronically and, and still trying to engage them in those ways. It has to be for the least of them and understanding to make it worthwhile. So, you know, from that standpoint, it left much to be desired. I didn't even get on. After they said it was virtual, I tried to like do on that Monday, I tried to get on the first session and it was like a whole, I was like, you know what, I'm just gonna go back to doing what I was doing because this is like a lot, you know, so I have to keep up and do. So um, I would give it, you know, a D for developmental, I guess, like a lot of room for improvement on HBCU week and then uh, bring back Detroit HBCU week, I guess, please. Ona. Yeah, nah, I couldn't get on. Like that journey was straight. All that together. Yo, and I'm hitting. I'm remember I was hitting you. I'm texting you like, yo, son, I can't get on. Like, what's what's going on? And you're like, no, try this, try this. And I was like, yo, I, there's money to be made. Like, I'm out of here. And I still don't got every day tips. Do I not text you just about every day? Did we? Did we? Did we? Did we? Do we know who? We're on watch. Like, and I got an attitude. Like, don't be like. This I feel like I'm trying to find out if I made line. Like this is just I don't like that. I don't like that at all. That's all I got. Katie. You're on mute. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uno. That was that was fuck, that's great. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You can edit that out. Um so like four things, four things. One, I really don't have nothing to offer because I didn't know what happened. Two, where's Stephen A. Smith? I thought this was his thing. He always, you know, oh, he's the he's the he's the, De- he's the Wilmington one. Um, yeah, you know, he has a national platform. Bring him to the national stage, then. Like, <laughs> where's Stephen A. Smith? But do um, we need like okay? I'm I'm kidding partially. Um, <laughs> but to that point, three, we talk about um our disappointment in the event. And largely because of our disappointment and how it was planned. And then when you look at the board real quick, you see that there's three lawyers and two entrepreneurs that are elder statesmen, if you will. Need some more diversity on that board, baby. Um, I, I continue to think, like, if the organization isn't doing well, is the board giving us what we needed to give? Is the board leading us in the right direction? And in this case, again, probably not. Right. If y'all are so disappointed, then you have every right to be because, again, I'm a K-12 teacher actively trying to get students into college, uh, you know, everywhere. But HBCUs in particular, of course, as an alum, um, especially as an alum of Coppin State University, which is about 15 minutes from my high school. Right. Um, and so for there to be a week dedicated to HBCUs and not a word of it come up in my school, which was just on the Today Show um, for a Monday night football game. I think is, uh, you know, this is a little disappointing, right? DC only 45 minutes away. Like there has to be something that we could have been included in that we just weren't. And I don't know how you expect people to participate in in an event um, that's virtual during the day when we all have jobs and stuff. I just, I don't know. I'm not taking off my day job to sit at a computer with you to learn about stuff that I already know. Like Luna said, it was wanted to be made. After a while, after like five minutes, like I'm about to get back to work. Yeah, it just doesn't make sense. It's like you like okay, again, I teach high school. At least give me something to show the kids. They're not gonna do that though. Give, give, you know, gonna... give me give me something to show the kids. Like, yo. They, don't, they actually uh, don't have high school based programming like that. Like and that's that that's been so my whole who, thing. Like, so who are you marketing to? HBCU alum who've already graduated, HBCU students who are already there. 
You not know, the students who are already there. They're the not a high value man, but a high value student. <laughs> even when I was a student and I saw whatever glimpses that I saw, I didn't even feel like it was accessible to me because I wasn't 4.0 NSGA Greek hmm. Pell student. Yeah. So I had, and I saw that too. Yeah. So at that point, then they need some restructuring. We need to table it. <laughs> but you can't do none of that. And that's why I'm waiting to find Without out who made line. Mm. Okay. So basically, what y'all are saying is, is that it reflects the entire DNC's real approach to HBCUs overall. I mean, it was a campaign point. It was something that was peddled as part of the whole reason to get behind Kamala, and they got the votes. After it was recounted, they really got the votes. They were on our campuses campaigning and getting people that look like us to actually, you know, register to vote because anything but Trump. And we voted for anything but Trump. And now we are an afterthought because we got treated like two cents. But hasn't that always been the status quo? But that, that's, Why you that's, treat me like animal? But that's, Why that's you treat me like animal? This is going straight <laughs> to YouTube. Good job. This is I'm, going straight to YouTube. You want to edit that, that part out? out. Edit that part out. No, out. I can't. Give me a beep. Give me a yeah, yeah. Give like a bleep. Put a bleep in there. Yeah. You'll sound something. Ooh, you know what I'm saying? This is oh, not bleepable radio. But it is frustrating, though. It's frustrating. It's frustrating. It's frustrating. Like, but that's how we got <laughs> treated, though. Like it's like we really be out here, and like I've lobbied. I've been in these rooms before. Like, at the very least, like, you ain't got nobody who could argue, oh, HBCUs do better than most other institutions as, as far as creating socially mobile black people that could become future employers for insert your state, insert your state. Like, nothing along those lines. There, nothing about any partnerships between the Googles and all these other, pe other people with, with HBCUs to get people into the next stage of STEM. Y'all still talk about the old STEM. We we beyond that. That's STEM to bloom. Like, yep. Y'all gotta move on. Like we need new blood. We, I'm just, I, but that's the problem. So now y'all said like they you can't I even get it out. <laughs> <laughs> he he mad case Aggie, in point. Son. <laughs> case in point though, case in point to this point, to this point, right? As far as like just trying to bridge this gap between uh high school and college and attracting students. Bowie had Bowie State University again. I don't know how they keep coming up, but they have a black male teachers. Um you know, program where they're actively trying to recruit black men to get an education since we are the smallest population. How does that not come up? Yo, there's been <laughs> what actually, there's week. institutions that have been doing that for the last 30 minutes years. away. Lincoln's been doing it. For what, like, Chase has one. Huston Tilston, too, in, uh, like, in Texas. They have a that. program, too. <laughs> No. But this is the same <laughs> problem it's always had. How many? I say this every goddamn episode. Thank you. We are HBCUs individually and collectively are all our individual gold mines. And there are some diamonds and rubies and emeralds in there that are not even at the bottom of the pile. They're right there at the top. But we are not standing Accessible. outside of our various gold yeah. mines saying, hey, over here, we got we got mad rubies. We got, you know what I'm saying? It's Margella in here, all right? We, we have this. And so like, I've talked to people that they didn't even know they had certain programs and they went to the damn school. I don't even go there. Hello, like, how do you have how do you have a government funded nuclear engineering program and nobody knows about it? And it's in South Carolina. And South look Carolina at that dumb line. I drop this every time because it's like, okay, if they have that, I can just say Tuskegee because you know Tuskegee good for it. Why does people not know that? And you have it, Bowie State again. They just signed a partnership with. Um, I want to say it's the Navy. They just, uh, it's like a, a pipeline to do with like Naval Aeronautics something. And they just signed, they just signed a, mem a memorandum of understanding like last month. That was on Maryland public access television. So it's like the same again, which is not, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's like, again, that's local. I live here. I can see that. But if I, I live in just have ROTC programs. 
Like what? <laughs> and it's like it's like the sad part is the schools themselves are they they suck. I'm so, if you hear me, you suck at marketing. Because if I go on your website and all of the stuff like that is not at the first two thirds of your website, you get an F, you fail. And then on the government side, how are you, how are you at the government, whatever branch of the government it is, you have government funded programs, fellowships that are 20 plus years old and you're not marketing, you're not connecting to people who are alum of these programs that are also went to insert HBCU here and making that connection. And why aren't they speaking at HBCU week? But you know what? To be to fair, point, Laurel, to hold be on, fair, hold all on HBCUs have sucky web designs. Most higher education does. Not design, content. Facts. It's content. It can That's look right. ugly, but if I can get yeah, all the information in the first five minutes. You got to pick a struggle. You can't right. Yeah. But to Laurel's point, because I, I've had a conversation, a few conversations with career and professional development area people. And some of the struggle is not just tied to what you, you both are saying, but it's tied to the fact that our students are first generation, mostly, right? And so they think just getting here, A, I'm going I'm to I'm get it. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm here cool now that's it but it's it's actually not it and you don't know that it's not it so they have to get to they have to get students to that point of even being hungry to even show up to apply do y'all know what it's like to be someplace at an hbcu that is not your hbcu and see how students are not hungry but they don't even know to be hungry so, so one I thing I can say about Howard, problem. I would say that's a it's higher savage. ed problem. It's, nah, that's it's, a K twelve problem. That's a that's, that's a, a matter of problem. culture. That's Howard's culture, though. Like Howard, yeah, Howard, Howard is not like a, these hustlers, and that's fine. But most right, but campuses, thinking, people ain't hungry. People like we literally grew up during a generation, and the generation after us has has, has, has fallen to them, where it's like, oh, if I get a degree, I'm good. And we ain't living in that society no more, right? Howard breeds that. There's some other HBCUs that breed like that. That Hampton, hustle, and that's cool. But what I'm, but the other side to it too is that you can't necessarily blame the students, especially if your career services office is still trying to teach somebody how to put together a resume and not telling somebody how to go out and actually find opportunities. You're still trying to tell somebody how to actually dress the part, speak the part, but y'all ain't really coaching anybody from a career perspective because that's a whole that's a whole other issue in itself forget like my entire job right now is to talk to students who have no idea what they want to do and help give them a plan right you need right? those people but Winston can tell you as he just alluded to in the chat a little bit there were how many how many students got picked up for moguls in the making how many Winston for midnight golf or you from what midnight golf we had seven from various HBCUs, right? Various, yeah, different HBCUs. I, 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 like we all know Detroit hustles harder, right? You, you, you can't beat Detroit. You, we know that. But like, it's not limited to Detroit. There's other places too. There's Chicago, right. New York. There's places where kids they have some of those innate abilities, and yes, you put them in, a, I, in the I'm right not, environment. I'm not, I'm not. I know. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Thank, thank you, Winston. Thank you. <laughs> I'm just saying. Oh, no, that. But like for real, like it's not just. It's not just that it, it has it's like a it's a mix of the culture, it's a mix of where they come from. It does take people like Eric doing that. And I don't think we have like I don't think we have the luxury of having people and having the people power to do that. Yeah, they're, they're coddled. That that's so yes. in part that that's the problem. Me and Laura were just talking about this not like earlier today. They're coddled, and the issue then becomes how do you prepare someone that's coddled when they yeah. they when they are it they feel entitled yeah when i got to school i'm a little you know a little bit older than y'all when i got to school it was a hustle like I, I still my mother just took the letter down from when i got accepted from the refrigerator like that there was a hustle yeah. there like there was hunger there they was like, I, I I don't know if I'm gonna make it. So let me talk to this one. Let me. 
the way I even got accepted to Hampton was on academic probation. And when I got there, mother was like, you better go find that man that said you could get in. And you that's your uncle. There yeah, isn't he's, that he's anymore. He's right. right. And and when anything goes wrong, it it's, breaks. Oh my God. Complaint how are they gonna go into the look me like I said, me and Laura was talking about this. How are they gonna go into the workforce? Not gonna make it. I'm like, baby, this ain't a Marriott. I was Honey. like, I'm not in I'm not in hospital. I told them every day. I was like, my first rule was that my hours are from nine to five. If you see me before or after nine to five, I am a hologram. I look like I'm here, but I'm not really here. The second rule is that this is not a Marriott. I don't work for Hilton. Okay. I don't work for the Ritz Carlton. This is not a concierge desk. So I can point you to if you if someone put a charge in your account, you need to talk to financial aid, babe. And if the first person you talk to doesn't help you, then you find somebody else and you take attack their the name, block. take their number, attack take their title block. and attack keep moving. But y'all feel I feel like with them, they meet the slightest bit of resistance. And then it's the world over. Nuke button. Let me let me blast y'all on Twitter and call Channel 4 News. And I'm going to be and it's like that. Listen, and that was pre pandemic. Right. 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 Oh, my God. These so children you already know <laughs> they about to wild out when it's full when it's full force. Heads is definitely going to wild out. <laughs> Woe is me. Pass out in the middle of the rotunda. Like, yeah. damn. Um, and if I've they don't tighten up, up definitely you'll cry in a month. My stars. No, it ain't gonna be our fault. Yeah. I'm gonna just quit. <laughs> Do y'all think we sound like how boomers sound to us? No, no, uh, no, no. Mm. No. No. And no. This is why no. We care. We actually right. care about the outcome. I don't that's think we care about the outcome. That's, that's why it's frustrating because that's why it's frustrating. That's because we wouldn't even say anything. If we, we right. just let them, we just let them die off and go where they go. If we didn't, no, if it didn't I I'm just asking. I'm just if asking. we were boomers, it would be like, mm. too, right? Because mm. like, we're stuck in the middle. Like we understand, like you still got to do some level of hard work. Even if you fall, you still got to you got to work back to equilibrium. Yeah. You just ain't gonna get all the way to where you want to go just because you decided to put some hustle in after the fact. Mm. But we also understand, I'm not working for nobody that ain't got a good work culture and good benefits and. Makes me feel like I actually want to show up good. here. Like, we ain't doing that either. We're not going to stay with a company for 30 years if you ain't paying me. I will go somewhere else the next day that they hire me and do all that, too. Nah. And we see all that because we, we done been through that. And we looking back at y'all like, do y'all not understand that this is the beginning of y'all grind? Y'all ain't even in it for real. Like, and, this, and, and, how's and, it and, in the real place? It's a figment yeah. of your, it's a figment of your late teenage and early twenty years if imagination, you're lucky. Yeah. right? If you're lucky, you know. And to that point, though, I think for us, we had to earn pr practically all the information that we had. I really okay. feel that way. I feel like we had to earn every bit of it. And for them, I'm like, look, I'll give you the easy part. The, just walk the ten miles. Walk the last ten. Just walk the last ten. You're not good at following the We were trying to Gretel in the trap. Like okay. We they follow like the calisthenics. Yeah. I teach, and I told them that. I teach 10 crack commandments, leadership style, and we talk about come ups and consequences. And to every action, it's either a come up or a consequence or both. And they don't understand, like, they only want come ups. Nah, kid. Like, there's, That's not real. there's, right, there's consequences to certain things. Well, I don't want to face that. Well, then you don't want to live here on this. You don't want to. You don't want to make no move, you, right? Like literally, what am I? Wait, I got to say this quote: "The mere imparting of information is not education. Above all things, the effort must result in making a person think and do for themselves, just as the Jews have done in spite of universal persecution." I like. I have to make you think. Because I'm not going to be here to think for you. Your mother, your father, whoever raised you is not going to be here to think for you. Like, I have students that come to me and ask me, what should they do? What do you want to do? Right. That's but your wife can job. tell me. I can't tell you. Because I know what I'm going to do. Right. I'm not you. Mm. And so it's like. And then do you have the drive to do what you think you want to do? <laughs> like, can you can you eat that? Like, <laughs> if it don't go your way. Can you take 12 years to get to where you want to go? Come on, somebody. Can you take the L? Because they don't want to take L. Well, yeah, forget, yeah, forget the 12 years. years. Are you going to take the first the L? No. Yes. Are you going to let your L turn into a loss or a lesson? No, no, Come on, kid. 
Are we those old people now, for real though? Hey, to Tiffany's point. Are we those old people? No, I'm just not. This is not. <laughs> Look, I'm not here. I ain't old people, so. Katie, <laughs> so old. It's just what they lack is experience, and that's not their fault, but I feel like they're hesitant to experience. experience. To no, even try it. it. But watch this, I, even try yo, it. I did five one on ones over the past like month and a half. I said, yo, what are you into outside of school? Nothing. What? Yo, KD, KD, <laughs> you see the you see the reasoning for all the stuff that we're talking about right now, though. These yeah. children were left behind in the mug, though. Like, yeah. wait, no, like, we, need to, we need Bush back. No child left behind. What's going on? No, so listen, it didn't go anywhere for the record. Like, <laughs> the one, one of the biggest things, no child left behind, still is walk. that there is no critical thinking in school no more. Ooh, if I get answers to the test, then I'm going to pass to the next place. But guess what? They're taking that same approach to life. They figure, mm. oh, I got the answers. I just got to know the answers. We I don't work that answers. way. Sure don't. Life is an abstract, okay? Hey, but that's the problem. So literally speaking, education is reflecting the issues that we have in life right now. I had these a kids has, had to critically think to do anything in high school, they're not coming to college with these same mindsets. No. They ain't got to think no more. No. Everything no. is right here. And even if it's right there, they ain't even looking at it. Look, they won't even Google and it's in their phones for answers. Now that's fact. That's fact. Because I'd be sitting there and they'd be like, I don't know. And I'd be like, you have a smartphone in your hand, kid. Like Why use that joint. This much a month? Why are your mother paying this much a month for you not to use the internet that's at your fingertips on the regular? We have you the most use? access to information than anyone else in the history of time, and yet they still. Which is why I said, isn't it wonderful that COVID is not a zombie virus? Because what would they do if this was The Walking Dead? Because you can't, <laughs> you can't, you gotta have hustle spirit in The Walking Dead. Yo, Where the survival skills? Hustle spirit. <laughs> Oh. Try to barricade ourselves in. You know what? <laughs> I'm just I'm just serious. Like, no like, we have to the move in 19 way. was zombie 19, and it was and it was a total societal breakdown. <laughs> hey, Laura, and we out music. here, people music. fighting over toilet paper and milk and Kool Aid. Yo, what would these alcohol. children do? And alcohol, the Hennessy is lit. No, no, I, I, was, no I was talking about the, the, the but they white still ain't picking up <laughs> Well, it's we Hennessy. We can do both. On do we have to? Lost episode. Actually, we could just land this plane right now. We can talk about the next segment later. Do we clap because we landed? Thank you so much for listening to HBCU Digest, Digest After Dark on Sirius XM Radio. It's like this is a lost episode, only on YouTube. Um, catch Man, us. If you don't cut this episode. If you just don't edit the last, it's like three words. They said bad it's word. Me. They said bad word. Yo, it's three it's words. Just edit. Just hit the bleep button. These three, three words. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you.